Thank you, Hans, for the really nice and warm welcome and hello to everybody. Let's start. Today we will uh, present uh, the challenges and opportunities of demand response with a special focus on residential area and buildings. Uh, so we will shortly um, go into some introduction into demand response, demand response resources and their potentials. And after that, René will uh, introduce you some of the market concepts uh, for integrating demand and enabling the flexibility. After that, we will show you some pilot projects and demonstration and discuss a little bit in detail of uh, actual case studies and give you a brief conclusion and outlook of what's going on and what are the next steps from our point of view. So let's start with uh, coming to the same picture of uh, what actually demand response means. And uh, there are many different definitions out there. You can find a lot of uh, very good and uh, detailed definitions and studies out there. So what we tried to do is uh, to define it for our context. And when we are talking uh, of demand side management, then we also think of including uh, everything on the demand side, even from efficiency, energy efficiency measures, like uh, isolating the building or reducing the demand by exchanging uh, devices. Uh, when it comes to demand response, we actually uh, we actually target to the devices which can be uh, in the, or can be changed by signals, uh, any kind of response signals like, uh, for instance, electricity price or, or similar signals. So changing actually the behavior, the consumption pattern of the electricity cons consumer, and uh, the flexibility is. Uh, is of course related to that demand response. That means it includes also the flexibility to, uh, to change the electricity consumption, but also in terms of, uh, of maybe increasing the generation on the demand side. Means uh, the, the side which is normally not uh, included in the generation. So from that definition, we go further to a brief overview about the categorization, categorization of demand response. So I suppose most of you are familiar with that categorization. Uh, just briefly, it can be divided into incentive-based and price-based uh, programs or schemes. And uh, there is a picture on the right side, which is uh, very uh, common, uh, commonly used for this kind of categorization. Uh, where we decide in within the price-based schemes, uh, like uh, for using time of use tariffs, or using critical consumption pricing, using, for instance, real-time pricing when the price signal is changing currently, or consumption-based price where the, the 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 amount of consumption actually is then uh, is depends on the price. Another Another categorization would also be to divide demand response resources into commercial and industry. So to say the big players in the demand response, uh, for the demand response program, or into residential. Next is uh, the challenges on opportunities. And I will briefly ask René to explain that. Yeah, this, uh, this is a summary of the uh the developments which currently take place in uh, electricity grids. And uh, the first uh, big uh, development currently is the electrification of energy delivery, which uh, leads to uh, uh, higher demand peaks. And you can imagine all the developments on electrical uh, vehicles. But al also uh, HVAC uh, systems are more and more uh, no longer based on uh, on natural gas uh, fired uh, systems, but on uh, electricity fired systems, and these together uh, lead to uh, a further stress on the uh, electricity system. 
and that's why currently there is uh, quite a lot of uh, development uh, into uh, smart solutions called smart grids to uh, to counteract these uh, distribution and transmission of electricity. Uh, furthermore, with the uh, increase in uh, distributed uh, generation, uh, as you all know, especially in uh, in Europe but also in the U.S., there is a lot of uh, introduction of photovoltaic uh, systems and of uh, wind turbines, and this distributed generation uh, has an output which is not that uh, reliable as other sources of uh, of energy and of electricity generation. Furthermore, there is uh, uh, appearing a more heterogeneous uh, electricity system with uh, hotspots of, uh, for instance, PV system in new residential areas, but also locally congested uh, areas. So if you have, uh, uh, for instance, charging poles for electric vehicles in uh, cities, then also there you get uh, congestion from uh, the demand side. And the PV systems lead to congestion from the uh, supply side, if not counteracted by uh, some measures in order to uh, to generate some uh, uh, demand response. And finally, also there's a tendency for legislation and regulation of uh, the sector to solve the problem where uh, it arises. And if you look at the current uh, system of electricity, it is optimized for operating and doing transactions from last generated, last generated on the last generators on the supply side, and have that uh, balanced with uh, averaged profiled uh, demands. And these profiled demands are uh, averaged on very large uh, amounts of uh, uh, demand. And uh, as already, already earlier stated. Uh, on the other hand, you have the heterogeneous uh, character of distributed uh, energy resources. So these are also things that are counteracting uh, one another. Uh, so summarizing, uh, if you look uh, to the power flows in uh, electricity grids, there is a tendency from uh, central to uh, distributed generation. And most importantly, also from a unidirectional uh, power flow going from the generation on the top of uh, the high voltage levels to the uh, uh, low voltage levels uh, lower in the grid. And that's also uh, leading to uh, a bidirectional uh, power flow. So also including uh, bottom-up uh, uh, transfers but also uh, uh, low more low voltage to low voltage uh, currents, especially uh, in residential areas. So that's also an uh, important uh, point for uh, demand response. Uh, and if you look at uh, some examples, if you look at the PV generation on a cloudy day, then what you can clearly see is that uh, the uh, output is fluctuating considerably. And uh, if not compensated, uh, then it uh, leads to, um, to instability uh, in the grid. And even more uh, 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 varying is uh, vent generation and the deviation from uh, the forecast. So what you see in the lower picture is the uh, realization of um, a wind turbine as compared to the forecast. And as you can see, at some times, the forecast is higher than the realization, and in other times the forecast is lower. And also the total system has to compensate for that. And a part of the system is uh, the possibility to have uh, demand response. Uh, now I give over to uh, Matthias to illustrate an example from EV uh, charging. Matthias? Yes, you see a typical a typical charge demand, energy demand profile from electric vehicle on a medium voltage network area where you have different sorts of uh, penetration scenarios of the number of electric vehicles. What you can see here is the opportunity charging. That means uh, when they arrive, they plug in and charge the car. And you can see the uh, with 11 kV that you generate 
actually quite a high demand for that. Uh, you can also see the span between winter and summer energy demand, which is obviously higher in winter. And you can also see uh, in terms of higher charging powers that you get actually quite a big fluctuation also a big and, and quite a large dynamics into into your electric charging of the number of cars. So that's actually what you not don't want in your in your energy system. And this is also a typical example for a good controllable load because you can actually delay the charging procedure. So the next uh, chapter will be then demand resources and their potentials. And uh, just briefly explain also the uh, possible categorization of demand response resources, uh, where we can actually categorize them in a static or flexible amount of demand response provided and also the timing. Unfortunately, the, the timing is missing for the horizontal axis. So there's also static and a flexible timing. And you can uh, think of full static consumption is maybe um, a device which cannot change its, uh, its demand behavior, but also a customer which, which, who is not willing to change his behavior according to a certain price change in the tariff. But you can also think of PV and wind as a kind of static uh, of, of a, sta a static resource because it uh, actually cannot change according to according to a, a signal or, or a change in price. On the other side, in in the in the field two, do you have a static amount of, uh, of power and energy? But a flexible timing of consumption. So this is, for instance, if you if a customer changes its behavior according to a different price signal, you can also have a flexible amount and a static timing, where you have a quite a certain cost cost curve, or also um, a static price high um, high high time price low time price, where the controllable load or generation is following that, and the post that. The fourth uh, segmentation will then be a fully dynamic consumption where you actually can uh, schedule your resource and can also, so you can actually determine the time and the amount which uh, this demand resource contributes to your, to your scheme. Uh, for typical demand resources and residential areas and uh, are storage, electric thermal storages, and electric storages, so which uh, uh, resources with high potentials are typically that which they, where they can divide or they can separate the time where the energy is used and the time where the energy is taken from the storage. So we are kind of buffering, uh, buffering this, uh, this process. And the typical uh, resources are in the warm water boilers, or cooling and freezing devices, or the heating where the building itself is a kind of a buffer for that consumption. And examples for that are uh, heat pumps, where they just operate on a different uh, set point of the of 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 the temperature. So they there are heat pumps out there which have a which have a, a signal uh, input for a smart grid signal where they can just rise the set point of the temperature and operate above the typical temperature. So essentially is that the customer is not affected by uh, providing this additional flexibility. Other, other, other typical the, uh, resources would be the electric storage from electric vehicles or stationary batteries, where opposed to the electric vehicles at stationary batteries, you are able to provide full flexibility uh, on a timely matter and on the amount. And other shiftable processes uh, are available at public services like water pumps or wastewater. Uh, like another example is uh, the typical load shifting for network operation is already in place for many, for, for different countries in Europe by the ripple control signal where the warm water is is shifted, the consumption and the charging of the warm water is shifted to night times. And the aggregation will lead us 
uh, come to that in more detail. That makes it more robust to pull all these different small resources. So an example I will give here is uh, is a new idea from a from uh, a new service provider from a boiler manufacturer and a telecommunication provider. So what they had in mind, or what they actually did, is equip uh, the hot water storage boiler with a slot for a SIM card. And so every boiler is uh, equipped with that control mechanism. And if when you buy such a boiler, you get you will get you will get contacted by the telecommunication operator, and he will ask you if you are willing to include a SIM card into your boiler, so that uh, the telecommunication operator can bo can pull your boiler and then aggregate it and participate in for instance secondary reserve. So that is something that is already happening and it's taking place, for instance, in the Austrian uh, energy system where the telecommunication operator participates and provides five megawatts on um, balancing reserve on the secondary market. So this is a, an example for using this kind of demand resource. The next thing will be the actual theoretical potentials of the different devices. And this is just an overview from a work from one of many studies of demand response potential in Europe. What I'd like to point out here is that actually the load reduction potential is less than the average potential to increase the load. And from that you can see for the, for the potential to increase the load, there are of course washing machines, tumblers and dishwashers, we all know that, but this is actually bound to changing the behavior of the customer. Whereas uh, the storage hot water and storage heaters can be operated automatically and have also quite a high potential for contributing uh, flexibility. So as an example from uh, Austrian case study uh, in, on the residential sector, you can see here what have been done uh, or what, what potentials are available for the Austrian energy system. And here again, the load increase potential is quite higher than the load reduction potential. And uh, what is important here is that you have to bear in mind, of course, that if you enable, if you take this uh, flexibility for a longer time, then you will have less, less potential available. So this is a kind of inverse time characteristics and is bound to the, to the characteristics of your flexibility resource, like uh, the rebound effect, like the ramp up and the duration and the interval and so on. So the typical motivations and applications behind this, uh, behind this demand response schemes are among, among others to reduce peak demand power in the system to provide balancing services, for instance, in the market, for the market, but also for your own portfolio optimization within your balancing responsible area or party or within a virtual power plant, for instance. So it can, it is used for integrating of renewables. This is also one of the main, uh, one of the main uh, motivation behind demand response. You can use it for, also for the grid congestion management, for network congestion management, or for instance, just as markets, for the market participation, for getting better energy prices, if you think of dynamic pricing. One of the drivers at the household level of the residential area is also the grid parity of the PV, of the PV generation, and for instance, the changing in the, in the funding scheme for curtailment of the maximum of the PV infeed. So what actually is incentivized is that you increase your, your coverage of your own generated electricity and shift your demand into the times where you generate PV. So you save for every, for every self-consumed uh, kilowatt hour and you save actually uh, the, the electricity if you use an in-house in your residential house. So the next uh, chapter will be the market integration and I will hand over to René. Okay, thank you uh, Matthias. Uh, 
so we heard uh, already uh, some things on uh, demand response and on uh, distributed generation with uh, renewable energy uh, systems. And the second question is, uh, what can you do with flexibility that you have? How, how can you use the flexibility that you have on a certain time scale uh, on, the, uh, on the market? And uh, it, the market systems in, in countries uh, slightly are different. Uh, but essentially, what you see is uh, that you have uh, uh, long-term markets uh, that uh, are operating uh, let's say uh, a year or uh, a few months before the actual uh, delivery between the uh, representatives of uh, the generation companies and the uh, demand uh, companies then uh, because it is not uh, possible to uh, to have an exact uh, estimate of the demand on a certain day because a number of uh, parameters are not yet know, known you also have uh, additional markets uh, called uh, short-term markets and uh, finally on the day itself on the day of delivery uh, you also have uh, the imbalanced market and a market in which you can uh, offer a spinning reserve and the value of your demand response or your generation uh, changes with uh, with time uh, considerably and if you look for instance at uh, the, the, the the system in the Netherlands. So here you have uh, the time axis on uh, X. You have uh, long-term options leading to uh, bilateral contracts and other bilateral contracts uh, approaching the uh, final point of delivery. And one day ahead you have uh, what in the Netherlands is the APX and that's uh, a market which uh, in which the last uh, contracts uh, for electricity are uh, sold between the demand and supply side uh, companies. So that market closes uh, one day before the actual delivery at uh, 12 o'clock. And if you then go to the, the day of delivery itself, even there you have imbalance market uh, cycles and also intraday market cycles, uh, leading to an exact balance just uh, at the moment that uh, the electricity will be uh, delivered. So there is a whole um, cascade of market which is, has as a result that uh, during a certain uh, period there is a, a continuous uh, balance at uh, all levels. Um, I think it's interesting to look at some uh, pictures of how this the price development on one of these uh, markets uh, is and that's the, uh, the day ahead market uh, for instance, in Scandinavia, what you see here is uh, the behavior of the uh, Scandinavian market uh, some years ago, when there was uh, uh, when the hydroelectric uh, uh, levels in the lakes were uh, exhausted, leading to a very high uh, electricity price uh, in the beginning of uh, the year, as as you can see here by the steep uh, peak. Uh, here, so the axis is uh, the day number in the year on the y-axis and on the x-axis the uh, moment uh, during a day, and what and the color indicates the uh, the price. You can see that there is a very uh, large price uh, at the beginning of the year due to the fact that uh, electricity is uh, very scarce, and if you look at uh, the same price development uh, in another country, uh, and that's uh, in uh, Denmark, then you can see that part of that uh, development is also uh, imported, as to speak, from the Scandinavian system to the Danish uh, system. But also what you can see is that typical, uh, a typical pattern uh, is going to, uh, to appear during uh, the, later, uh, the late summer period. And that's the period that uh, the uh, office workers start again after their uh, holidays. And you can also see that uh, due to the fact that the systems are interconnected, that that's also part of the, uh, the winter uh, peak due to the fact that in Scandinavia the uh, lakes were, uh, were frozen is also important in the, the Danish uh, system. And finally, if you look at uh, 
the Dutch uh, system, then you can see that the behavior of the price and also the value of the electricity and the flexibility is uh, considerably uh, different. Uh, so you have much more uh, varying pricing prices during whole the year. And you can also imagine that with demand response, especially uh, in the period when the prices are high, high and that's uh, during uh, uh, the beginning of autumn and the beginning of the winter, that uh, the value of flexibility and also of demand response is uh, a lot higher than as compared to, uh, to other periods. Uh, so we already discussed some uh, challenges and uh, also some possibilities of uh, DR. And during the last uh, decade, a lot of uh, opportunities also have uh, appeared to, uh, that, that make demand response and demand side management applications uh, much more likely than they were uh, before, and that's uh, the ink one cause is the increase in uh, information systems used in energy grids. So uh, currently there is a strong uh, buzzword called uh, smart grids, but I think basic is the, uh, the application of the information systems. And what you see in the Netherlands and also in the US and other countries is that um, there is a strong tendency for uh, introducing uh, smart meters and also to, to have these uh, smart meters connected to uh, smart energy systems. And also from the uh, distribution system operator uh, point of view, you see that the, there's a strong tendency to know uh, and to monitor what's happening at the, the lowest levels uh, of the grid. And that also uh, is, is one of the results of having more information systems uh, uh, available and uh, communication and message exchange more and more is possible between all types of loads and uh, generations on uh, all levels uh, in the grid. So that's one thing for the, uh, the information systems. On the other hand, you also have the possibility to uh, aggregate loads of uh, a certain nature or, or in a certain uh, area into uh, a virtual power plant, as it's called, and a virtual power plant uh, may reach a size which is uh, comparable to uh, a real uh, power plant. And uh, currently, a lot of uh, field tests are uh, occurring, in which we, which we also will discuss uh, later in this uh, uh, webinar, in which uh, the, the uh, these virtual power plants, which are aggregations of uh, many uh, small devices or uh, small installations to uh, to to use them and uh, currently uh, virtual power plants can be combined in uh, commercial clusters uh, supporting market parties to uh, increase the value of uh, flexibility they can also be uh, combined into uh, technical clusters uh, and also in that respect it has to be uh, uh, named that uh, the uh, DNOs and, T and TNO standing for distribution network operators and transmission network operators are becoming much more uh, DSOs and TSOs, uh, distribution system operators and transmission system operators, and uh, also including the information system uh, aspect. And finally, uh, also what you see is that that also, communities are uh, forming uh, currently in, uh, in the special residential areas. And uh, so currently, there are also already community batteries uh, in a certain residential area, which store part of the uh, generated uh, PV. And also, demand response is, uh, is, is very important to uh, to manage the storing of the electricity in in these types of uh, community batteries. So that's for the uh, the opportunities. Uh, and Matthias now will give a more uh, systems view 
on the uh, enabling demand response and uh, distributed generation with renewable energy resources. Matthias? Yes, uh, introducing task 17 uh, from the IEA, uh, implementing agreements on on-site management. We are focusing on the way how to f enable the flexibility between homes and buildings and to operate on the grid and participate in markets. So what we actually do is uh, try to bring together experts and discuss the current approaches and, uh, and, and actual pilot studies and analyze uh, the certain best practices which can then be transferred or scaled up to other countries and synthesize a report out of that. So we're currently uh, operating until the summer of 2016 and we are uh, also currently uh, preparing reports on our, on our findings. So I think for that, go to the next slide, where really explains the embedding in the social and regulatory context. Yeah, I think that that's also an, an important uh, point for the introduction of demand response and also of uh, distributed uh, generation with renewable energy systems. So, uh, so, so currently most of the, the cost benefit analyses are done purely on the, uh, the euro and dollar level. But I think also important is the, um, the carbon dioxide and the energy efficiency that is uh, gained by uh, uh, using these types of uh, techniques. And, and that's where the market design comes in and the access to the market for also the, the smaller uh, systems of uh, energy generation and uh, demand on one hand. And also the regulation for uh, transport and uh, distribution. And if you look at the uh, DR potentials, then uh, if you look on the kilowatt hour scale, the prospective uh, potential can be used commercially, as we already saw from the, 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 the increased value that you get when positioning the flexibility in a, at a time that the market price is uh, high. And if you look at the monetary uh, perspective, then uh, you can look at the regulation for how to manage uh, congestion. And that's something that's on the right part of this, uh, this uh, figure. So embedding the, uh, these, these uh, resources into uh, uh, society, there are a lot of uh, factors which are uh, important to make that uh, happen in uh, a good way. And if you look at the, 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 the manner that uh, the R can be introduced to, uh, to users and to, uh, to user devices, then uh, if you look at the history of the R, uh, then originally uh, it's a little bit, uh, there is a, a kind of a passive role uh, for uh, the users. Uh, so they <clears throat> are uh, managed from uh, the top, and this this picture is from a field experiment some uh, eight years ago in which a dis uh, distribution system operator uh, sent SMSs to uh, people uh, when it was most uh, uh, what what was the most suited moment moment to uh, to start washing, and you can see that there is a quite a lot of development. So currently, uh, you also have user displays in which the, the, the timing is given, uh, the, the energy moment. So this is a picture from uh, a test done by uh, Inexis in the Netherlands. And you can see in this scheme that uh, certain moments in time are flagged to be more or less suitable for certain processes. So that's the, the more active DR. But, uh, the role of the user is, is very, uh, very important in, this, uh, in, in these uh, systems. And currently, uh, a lot of effort is being, being done in uh, automated uh, demand response, which is uh, highly, uh, as it's called, uh, transactional. And a number of uh, techniques already are uh, developed, and there will be some uh, some examples of that. So one is uh, power matcher, which is a technology which strives to coordinate uh, supply and demand in a 
completely automated uh, way using uh, software agents. And also transactional energy and intelli intelligator are techniques which uh, try to satisfy this, these requirements. So in, the, in, in this uh, way of looking at, uh, at systems, it's possible to, uh, to use bottom-up agent-based mechanisms to uh, get a very uh, good balanced amount of uh, demand response. So then we go to the pilot's demonstration and case studies. And uh, Matthias will first uh, discuss some of the uh, experiments done uh, in uh, Austria. So what you can see here is uh, uh, residential apartments on the, in the smart grids model region uh, Salzburg. And uh, what the plan was, the objective in this project was to reduce power demand peaks uh, uh, during high power times uh, and so to say use the use the generation of the heat of the heat and the warm the warm water needed for these residential buildings uh, opti in an optimized way so what you have you have heat pumps you have also a micro CHP combined heat and power uh, uh, generator and you have district heating as well as the direct electricity heating which can be used from from the electricity grid or from the PVs on the roof. So on the, on the one hand, you have a highly automated and uh, an optimized uh, uh, building management system using the heat sources in an optimized way. On the other hand, you have also a number of uh, ways <coughs> to, part to include and to participate for, for including the customers, which I will show in the next slide. So coming to the building again, you have on the right side, you have the big warm water tank up there. And one of the main challenges in energy efficient buildings is to, uh, to supply the warm water for, for, the, for the customers, for the users. And uh, the thing is here to buffer again the usage of the energy from the energy supply when, it's, uh, when the warm water is generated with this thermal, thermal storage. So you can use uh, the CHP as a source for the warm water. You can use the PV or the electricity grid or the district heating uh, and the heat pump, of course, which is also either feeded by the electricity from the grid or by the PV. So what you want to do is a grid-friendly building. And under any circumstances, you want to preserve the comfort for the users of the building. So for participating for the customers, uh, they, they realized a kind of, uh, of a kind of watch we call the four watch, where the price of the next 12 hour, hours is shown and uh, coded in the red, yellow, and green. So the customers actually see when the when there is uh, times of high prices and times of moderate or low prices, and they are expected to react according to the. clock and uh, change the behavior. So we have two aspects here. We have the automated demand response and we have the behavioral changes in the demand response. What you actually see as the outcome of in the consumer evaluation, you see here the typical usage of this forecast watch in the smart center, we call it. And you can uh, see on the right upper side the activity on the website where, they can, where the customers can inform about their electricity consumption and about their actually uh, price and the bill. And you see that uh, actually the activity is only triggered by certain events when they introduce some interviews or, or, or send the, the bill out and so on. But what you can see on the, on the lower part of the illustration that actually the energy efficiency is increased uh, with respect to the reference group. So informing them, them and telling them how to use uh, more energy efficiency uh, devices, also introducing some eco buttons, some kind of uh, uh, switching off all, all standby devices when they leave the, 
with the flat, they can actually uh, achieve uh, a certain amount of percentage of energy efficiency. What they also figured out that uh, they actually managed to shift the dishwasher consume and the usage of the dishwasher. They not managed to shift the cooking, of course, and the overall uh, result is that the comfort comes for the consumption. When you look at the results from the automated demand response part, you see that actually the intelligent usage of the energy sources for the warm water uh, can be optimized using the CHP in times where there is the, 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 electric, uh, the, the network congestion high or where they can get more money out of that red area. And the, actually the CHP is reduced where the price is, the electricity price or the network tariff in that case is cheap. Also, they can uh, increase the usage of the H of the heat pump in time in times where there is uh, actually a low price. But when it comes to the cost savings, you can see that uh, also this optimization in the in the in the operation of these sources, they can actually save up to 10, uh, even more percent of their of their spending for the for the operation. Reading of this building. The next project we want to like to introduce briefly is uh, the Grid Smart, which comes, uh, which takes place in the in the U.S. and was developed uh, in the terms of terms of transactional energy or the transactional demand response. And what they here implemented is a real-time market at the distribution feeder level. So every distribution feeder has their own real-time market and reacting to uh, the network congestion on this feeder. So the actual, well, there are different value streams, uh, like the energy, the benefit of the energy purchase, the time of when they purchase the energy. But there is also capacity benefit when they react according uh, to congestion in the network. Uh, this demand response mechanism uses a kind of market bidding mechanism, which I will explain in the next slide, to perform uh, this distributed optimization. So about 200 homes were participating on four feeders, and there were a market run on each feeder uh, with a five-minute time span of clearing, sending out the price and, and reacting according to the bidding. Uh, there took also a lot of HVAC systems have participated in automatic, automated bidding, uh, the so-called smart thermostat and home energy manager uh, did automatically uh, react to that signal. And in the next part, you can see uh, how that actually works. So every device which participates has a kind of uh, load price curve, which simply means that at a certain price, they would reduce or stop their consumption. And this is the first step, this is aggregated in the second step to the whole pr load price curve for the whole house, household. And this can be expressed by a simple table expressing the, the amount of load and the price for this load. And this is then aggregated on the feeder level where they have the actual capacity available for the feeder, so the transport of the electricity capacity and where you can then settle the price. And this price is again then broadcasted back to every household and every device which participated in that uh, will stick to its original price load curve and then consume according to that price. So what you can see is actually in action how that worked, that when the, in, the upper, in the upper illustration, upper graphic you see the reduction of the feeder capacity. And you can see that the HVAC units, HVAC units all drop off and stop the operation. And after that, when the signal, the congestion has been released, there is a kind of rebound effect where they uh, get back their energy they needed to operate. And the next 
project will be more power matcher and again René will explain that to you. Yeah, thanks uh, Matthias. <coughs> well, the power matcher technology was um, uh, developed at uh, formerly ECN and later uh, TNO and now it's, it has been tested in a lot of uh, 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 living labs uh, including uh, real households and first I'll, I'll go a little bit into uh, the technique uh, for automatic uh, demand response which is implemented in uh, power matcher. <coughs> uh, this is a picture of a power matcher uh, cluster and essentially uh, what you have are three different types of uh, nodes which are represented by uh, agents. So uh, for example here you see uh, uh, a car which is uh, connected to uh, a de via a device interface to a device agent. Uh, you see other agents here as well. So you see a PV uh, agent representing a solar panel. Uh, here you have a heating system with a hot water storage buffer which also is treated as a device. You have some vibe good uh, devices being part of uh, the cluster. So typically uh, <coughs> You can map the, the, the electricity uh, usage or generation of devices. You can uh, map them in the uh, device agent uh, interface. And also there is an objective agent which points to the, uh, the, the way that the agents uh, interact uh, with one another. So the, this is the first uh, type of uh, agent which is uh, possible in a power matcher uh, virtual power plant. Uh, the second uh, is uh, the concentrator agent that uh, concentrates uh, messages which are, which are interchanged between uh, the, uh, the agents uh, within power matcher and actually the, 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 the basic uh, message is uh, very simple. So what, what is going to from the device to the concentrator agent is uh, a bit, and I'm going to into that uh, later. And what is returned is uh, a price. And actually, uh, depending on uh, the bit and the price, the device is switched on or is switched off. So that's um, the, the device agent and the interaction of the device agent. Apart from the concentrator agent, you also have uh, auctioneer agents. And actually what the auctioneer agent does is connect, uh, combining all the bits and, uh, by, and also by uh, adding all the bits, coming to the uh, point where the, uh, the supply and demand is in uh, equilibrium. So that's uh, just as in uh, as in other types of markets, uh, the price is uh, determined by the equilibrium point where the supply meets uh, the demand and that price is uh, returned. So actually you, with this relatively simple technology, which can be also uh, spread over uh, different uh, uh, agents on different uh, computers, uh, can be uh, implemented to uh, coordinate uh, supply and uh, demand. And in this uh, uh, sheet you can see the different uh, types of uh, agents. So actually you have uh, three types. You have the device agents, which is at the end, it, which is a leaf node in a power match hierarchy. And on the device agents, the, the different uh, attributes of a certain type of primary process are uh, met. Then you have the concentrator that uh, concentrates the bits from uh, the agent and also defines the hierarchy and you can have in a power matcher application the concentrator uh, mapped on physical devices uh, in the grid and in that way also try to uh, influence uh, also to uh, deliver services which are can be operated uh, locally and also the important thing is the root matcher in a power matcher uh, hierarchy 
and that's uh, where the auctioneer is uh, is uh, running and the auctioneer does the matching between the total supply and uh, demand in a way similar also to the test that uh, Matthias earlier um, uh, explained and uh, so you have software agents communicating with uh, a matcher so the agent produces uh, bid updates and the matcher uh, gives price updates and depend depending on the price updates the agent either uh, continues uh, generating or uh, demanding uh, electricity or at a certain moment in time uh, stops the uh, supply or demand and uh, with, with this concept it is uh, possible to uh, have a, a to reach a high scale of uh, of number of agents and concentrators that you can connect to one uh, matcher. Uh, to give an example of uh, the uh, uh, the construction of uh, the bits, uh, here uh, a freezer is modeled with a certain ambient uh, temperature and a kind of uh, user usage pattern, and that freezer has a certain uh, temperature. And it can be switched on or uh, switched off depending on what is happening in the outside uh, world. So if you the 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 the, the temperature is um, too high for a freezer, that's not a good uh, business case. Then uh, at any price in this bit curve, the uh, requested power is uh, the the nominal power of uh, the freezer. So, uh, as a power matcher agent, this uh, this this freezer will run at uh, any price. If you look at uh, uh, another uh, point in time when the, uh, the the temperature in the cell is lower than the the minimum temperature, then at 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 no price the <coughs> the freezer will uh, buy electricity. And again, if, if the cell is somewhere in between, it's in a may run uh, status. So uh, dependent on uh, yeah on the equilibrium price in uh, the the total network of the agent, the uh, the freezer will either uh, be active or will be uh, off. So that so that's completely dependent on the the situation in the network. Um, of in the total cluster of uh, the agent so in this way it's possible to uh, to make uh, individual devices uh, aware of the the context of the the cluster of the virtual power plants that they are uh, operating in so that's uh, basically the idea illustrated by this uh, example uh, if you look for instance at uh, a storage device you, you have a similar uh, type of uh, uh, bit curve. So uh, if the price is low, then the storage device will be uh, uh, will try to uh, to store electricity. And if the price is becoming uh, too high, then it will uh, discharge. And you can see that that by using these types of bit curves, depending on uh, the equilibrium price, which is um, the orange uh, line, vertical line, uh, the storage device very uh, swiftly uh, adapts to the uh, the, the current uh, market uh, price of the cluster, and in that way uh, balances uh, more or less the behavior of uh, the rest of the devices. So having these types of storage devices in the cluster also has a smoothening effect. Uh, within the virtual power plant uh, cluster. Uh, so the priority is translated into a price dependent on the current state of the primary process. That's basically the uh, idea. And the expression of that is in the bit curve. Uh, and by using this, you, 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 if, if no one is aware of the, uh, uh, of the other components in uh, the grid, you you get uh, 
an inelastic uh, demand response that is uh, indicated uh, here. And by using elastic uh, demand, it is possible also to use the demand side to uh, to be to get involved in the operation of the cluster, leading to a more elastic and lower uh, clearing price. So that's uh, also the economics of power matching and also of uh, demand response uh, mechanisms. And uh, so demand response can be uh, continuous. It can be instantaneous, depending on the type of device that you have. And from our field test, it appears that all these behaviors of uh, demand can be expressed into uh, bid functions. And uh, this is an example of the uh, commercial aggregation of devices in a 25 household cluster, as we experienced as we experimented with it in uh, Hoogkerk, which is. Uh, a residential area in the neighborhood of uh, Groningen, uh, the Netherlands. And what you see here is uh, in blue the forecasted uh, profile. And uh, in red you see the desired profile, which also accounts for some interaction with uh, an external objective to uh, deliver services to uh, the electricity market. And in green you can see the realized uh, profile. And what you see is that uh, Using these virtual power plant uh, concepts, it's possible to uh, very flexibly uh, uh, use the demand to uh, to balance a cluster in a cluster of households to a certain predefined uh, objective. Uh, also, you can use uh, some preemptive uh, behavior in that. And uh, in the cluster, we had some uh, some heat pumps. Uh, at some residential dwellings and some micro CHPs uh, as well that produce uh, electricity apart from uh, heat. And uh, you can see that uh, if you look at the, the, this price pattern in red, that uh, the heat pumps preemptively uh, store their uh, buffers. And also the uh, uh, micro CHP use uh, the same mechanism. So anticipating uh, a lower price also uh, fill their buffers. So that's a nice illustration that you also can be commercially active uh, using such a cluster. Uh, so if you look at uh, Europe, you see that the total uh, business activity in demand response is uh, considerably uh, increasing. And you can see, for instance, uh, if you look at the map on the, the left uh, part of this uh, sheet, then you, you see some uh, preliminary developments and partial openings for demand response in a number of European countries. And if you look at the picture from uh, last year, then you can see that uh, it's, it's more and more possible to uh, facilitate the demand response also in a business-wise way on uh, the market. So. Uh, as you can see, the, uh, the power system is more and more uh, transformed in something that's, that has a physical and dedicated role and also has ICT systems very closely related to the uh, physical infrastructure. But also you have a lot of information systems which might communicate with uh, the supplied, supply and demand uh, devices and that uh, these both worlds are more and more uh, coupled by an interoperable uh, service provider, which is able to uh, support the uh, physical infrastructure as well as the, uh, the ICT infrastructure that's loosely coupled to it. So this brings us to the uh, conclusions. Uh, Matthias? Yes, um, as, you, as we mentioned before, there will be an some new roles necessary for enabling the flexibility. And uh, one concept we already explained, which is the aggregator, which provides the market, provides access to the market for the small resources, which is also known as pooling, and uh, which is also uh, fostered by the uh, European Commission as, uh, as a part of the directive for the energy efficiency. Uh, according to that, a lot of uh, 
of a lot of local regulations and uh, legislative uh, framework has to be changed or is already have been changed or is in the process to be changed to allow this pooling of the small resources for the market participation. And uh, another role is the flexibility service provider, uh, which has uh, also, he is also including flexibility in the generation and the demand and uh, will also can also be have can also have of course the function of aggregating small resources but also of course large customers or generations you can think of uh, an operator of a virtual power plant as well as a kind of flexibility operator uh, for instance how the European Commission the smart goods expert group 3 sees uh, this kind of uh, possible interactions and roles uh, between uh, DSO and the customer and the market. So you have in the regulated domain, you have the DSO, which uh, asks for or procures a kind of flexibility from the flexibility operator or the aggregator, which operates more or less in the commercial domain for providing flexibility. Uh, and the last slide is uh, the way how to proceed to enable the customer is seen by the European Commission. Uh, one, one enabler would, would be a common shared data management operator who is responsible for sharing uh, all this data from the customer side so that it will enable new market player, new business models, uh, within the energy market and this is currently discussion on going on uh, how to set up such a, a data hub and which roles and responsi responsibilities are set up with this data hub. So coming to the conclusion, Rene, if you... Yes. Yes, that's, that's, that's the, the, the preliminary result of the work uh, that we're doing within the IEA, IEA Task 17 uh, Phase uh, 3 is uh, that uh, <coughs> field tests uh, show that the increase of flexibility can be uh, shown and also that uh, the costs are decreased and the comfort increased by the optimization of energy use also by using these types of uh, bottom-up uh, techniques. Uh, another point is that the, uh, in current tariff and market situations, uh, especially if you look at the, the small, uh, what's called prosumers, the, so, so these, uh, the, the traditional consumers also producing, that uh, the current tariff and market situation uh, mostly is not uh, optimal. And uh, so it, especially having market access also for uh, smaller uh, volumes of load and of generation would be very beneficial. Furthermore, the incentives to end users uh, need to be uh, clear. And if you have flexibility in end user process, it's it's necessary also to uh, retain the uh, energy efficiency of the uh, processes which are uh, using or generating uh, the electricity. And uh, if you want to have enduring uh, effects, so that then uh, it's necessary also to utilize the uh, ICT systems for uh, learning user preferences and also uh, automate as much as possible of the actions of uh, devices. So that's that's also uh, one of the things that uh, I think currently is one of the, the, the developments also in the uh, transactional uh, energy uh, arena. Uh, and furthermore, it's, it's very important to have a very good look at uh, user behavior and the way that user interacts with uh, the uh, systems which are used for uh, uh, demand re response. And within IEA also there are uh, tasks which are specifically uh, looking at that. And uh, I think also that, uh, that's a very important uh, point in this respect. So that's uh, for uh, the conclusions. Um, 
Well, I think uh, it's now the time for uh, for questions, and it's I think it's also possible to uh, to contact us uh, if you have any further uh, offline questions uh, by uh, the coordinate by using the coordinates that we uh, have uh, mentioned uh, here. So. Uh, so that's for uh, the presentation uh, part. Uh, so what we still also do have is uh, some uh, references. So there's a general reference to the IEA uh, Task 17 on the uh, IEA DSM.org uh, site. Furthermore, I think there's a lot of material on the uh, site of the Smart Energy Demand uh, Coalition. And also, we've included some, uh, some smart grid uh, project uh, references. Uh, so there is a clip from an experiment uh, that has been done in uh, Darmstadt in the European Web to Energy project, and also the uh, European Commission has uh, a lot of information on markets and consumers, and also the legislative uh, harmonisation there, and finally also the smart grid mandate. Also, uh, is very uh, nice to have a look.